Hello everybody, my name is Iman. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today we're going to be tackling a practice problem set that relates to our chapter on social thinking. So let's go ahead and get started. Problem number one says the tendency to become close friends with neighbors rather than people in other neighborhoods is most strongly related to which of the following factors. Now in lecture, we talked about interpersonal attraction as what makes people like each other. And we said that it's influenced by multiple factors from physical characteristics to similarity to self-disclosure and reciprocity as well as proximity. Now if we look at the answer choices, all four answer choices are things that influence social attraction. Let's go over what each of these terms mean. Proximity, being physically close to someone. Reciprocity, this is in which we like people who we think like us. Self-disclosure, this includes sharing fears, thoughts, and goals with another person and then being met with empathy and non-judgment. And then similarity is sharing attitudes, intelligence, education, and many other factors. Now this problem says this is that we're trying to look for a influence for social attraction that's based off of the tendency to become close to people who are nearby, being friends with your neighbors, as opposed to people who live elsewhere. And proximity is what deals with the tendency to be attracted to those who are physically close by. And so the answer here, for one, is going to be A, proximity. Now, problem number two says, which of the following would be associated with high levels of aggression? Statement one says increased amygdala activity. Statement two says decreased amygdala activity. Statement three says increased prefrontal cortex activity. And four says decreased prefrontal cortex activity. Now, when we talked about aggression, we said that aggression is a physical, verbal, verbal or nonverbal behavior with the intention to cause harm or increase social dominance. And we said how that there are multiple parts of the brain that contribute to violent behavior. Now, the amygdala is one of those. The prefrontal cortex is another. Activity of the amygdala is going to increase aggression. Now, as for the prefrontal cortex, this should control aggression. All right, so amygdala increases aggression. Prefrontal cortex controls aggression. And so if the problem is asking us what would be associated with high levels of aggression, increased amygdala activity makes sense because activity of the amygdala increases aggression. Now, the other statement that makes sense is decreased prefrontal cortex because the prefrontal cortex should control aggression. And so a decrease in the activity of the prefrontal cortex would play into seeing high levels of aggression. And so here statements one and four make the most sense, which makes the correct answer for two B. Wonderful, let's move into problem three. Problem three says a child who cries when his mother departs and smiles and runs to his mother when she returns is displaying which type of attachment pattern? So let's just quickly review our attachment patterns here. So attachment is an emotional bond to another person and it usually refers to the bond between a child and a caregiver and we talked about four types. Secure attachment. This requires a consistent caregiver so the child is able to go out and explore knowing that they have a secure base to return to. And so the child, they will show strong preference for the caregiver here. Then we have avoidant attachment. This occurs when the caregiver has little or no response to a distressed crying child and the child will actually show no preference for the caregiver compared to strangers. Then we have the ambivalent attachment. This occurs when a caregiver has an inconsistent response to a child's distress. Sometimes they respond appropriately and sometimes they are neglectful. And so the child will become distressed when the caregiver leaves and they will be ambivalent when they return.
Then the last attachment we talked about is disorganized attachment, and this occurs when the caregiver is abusive. The child shows no clear pattern of behavior in response to the caregiver's absence or presence, and they may show repetitive behaviors. All right, so with that reminder, all right, this problem says that this child cries when their mother leaves, and they are super excited when the mother comes back. This attachment pattern is very much representative of a secure attachment, right? Because secure attachment is seen when a child has a consistent caregiver and they're able to go out and explore knowing that they have a secure base to return to. And so that means the child will be upset when the caregiver leaves and they will be com feel comfort when the caregiver returns, which is exactly what's being demonstrated in this problem. And so the correct answer here for three is going to be D. Let's go ahead and move into problem number four. Problem four says elephant seal males mate with multiple females each mating season while females only have one mate each. What type of mating system is this? Now, a mating system describes the way in which a group is organized in terms of sexual behavior. Monogamy, this consists of exclusive mating relationships, which is obviously not what is being explained here. So we can go ahead and cancel that out. Now, promiscuity, this allows a member of one sex to mate with any member of the opposite sex without exclusivity. Now, here in this kind of mating system, what we see is that the males have multiple partners, but the females only have one partner. So promiscuity doesn't make sense in this case as well. The next type that we talked about was polygamy, which consists of one member of a sex having multiple exclusive relationships with the members of the opposite sex. Now, one type is polygyny, which is a male with multiple females, but there's also a different type. I only have this one written, but another type is polyandry, which is a female with multiple males. Now here, What's being explained is that there's a male with multiple females. And this falls under the umbrella of polygyny. And so that would be the correct answer. So four is going to be B. Wonderful. Let's move on to problem five. Problem five says a person with a ventromedial hypothalamus injury will likely show which behavior? Now, a person with a ventromedial hypothalamus injury, they will never feel satiated when eating, and they will therefore never feel the sensation to stop eating. We talked about this in lecture. We also compared it to what would happen if a person had a lateral hypothalamus in injury. A person with a lateral hypothalamus injury will never feel hunger and will have decreased food intake. But again, we're being asked for ventromedial hypothalamus injury. They will never feel full. And so if we're looking at the answer choices, a person with a ventromedial hypothalamus injury will likely show which behavior, increased empathy or decreased empathy. This has nothing to do with the hypothalamus, so we can go ahead and cross these out. C says increased food intake and D says decreased food intake. C is going to be the correct answer because a person with ventromedial hypothalamus injury will never feel full, so they will keep eating and therefore have increased food intake. Five is C. Let's go ahead and move into problem number six. Problem six says female great reed warblers are attracted to males with larger song repertoires because they tend to produce offspring with higher viability. This is an example of which of the following? Runaway selection, sensory bias, direct phenotypic benefit, or indirect phenotypic benefits. All right, so when we talked about mating and mate choice, we talked about different mechanisms of mate choice. Let's go over them. Phenotypic benefit, this is an observable trait that makes a potential mate more attractive to the opposite sex. Then there's sensory bias, which is the development of a trait to match a pre-existing preference that exists in the population. Then we have Fisherian selection or runaway selection, which is a positive feedback mechanism in which a particular trait that has no effect 
or a negative effect on survival becomes more and more exaggerated over time, usually because it is sexually appealing. Then there's indicator traits, which is traits that signify overall good health and well-being of an organism, increasing its attractiveness to mates. And then last, genetic compatibility, the creation of mate pairs that when combined have complementary genetics. Now, going back to our problem, here, phenotypic benefits, this refers to observed traits in an individual that make them more attractive to the opposite sex. This is exactly what's being explained here when they say that these female warblers are attracted to males with larger song repertoires because they tend to produce offsprings with higher viability. And so the correct answer here is going to be either C or D, phenotypic benefits. Now we have to figure out whether it's going to be direct or indirect. We can go ahead and cancel out A and B. Now benefits associated with increased fitness through direct material advantages, these are direct benefits, while indirect benefits involve increased genetic fitness for the offspring. The lateral makes more sense for this scenario, and so the correct answer for six is going to be D, indirect phenotypic benefits. Let's go ahead and move into problem seven. Seven says in several species of shrimp, the larger adults will sacrifice themselves to protect the younger, smaller shrimp. How is this behavior best explained? Is it through inclusive fitness, direct benefit, sensory bias, or foraging? Now, in evolutionary psychology, inclusive fitness is a measure of the number of offspring an individual has, how they support their offspring, and how their offspring can support others. Inclusive fitness really promotes the idea that altruistic behavior can improve the fitness and success of a species, just like we talked about in lecture. And so the behavior in this scenario can be described as altruism, benefiting another at one's own expense, and it falls under inclusive fitness. And so the correct answer for seven here is going to be A. Eight says, which of the following is not a component of social perception? This is a really easy definition question. We talked about the three primary components of perception being the perceiver, the target, and the situation. And so that means the answer here is going to be D. The process is not a component of social perception. Now for number nine. Nine says, when you first meet Dustin, he is very rude to you. You run into him twice more and he is very friendly, but you still dislike him because of your first meeting. What impression bias does this describe? All right, so you are really caught up on that first impression you had with Dustin. Now, the impressions we form when meeting others are influenced by a number of perceptual biases. The primacy effect, this refers to those occasions when first impressions are more important than subsequent impressions. And that makes the correct answer for nine A. Recency effect, just to remind you, this is when the most recent information we have about an individual is most important in forming our impression. Reliance on central um, traits and proximity don't really have much to do here with explaining your fact that you're caught up on that first impression about Dustin and not letting go of the fact that he was rude in your first encounter, even though he was friendly in his later encounters. And so again, the correct answer for nine is A. Let's go ahead and move into problem 10. 10 says, Glenn brings cookies to work. Although you have not yet tasted them, you say to another coworker, Glenn is such a great guy. I'm sure these cookies are fantastic. What type of bias is this? Is it reliance on central traits, direct benefits, halo effect, or similarity? Now, I'm going to tell you the correct answer. Correct answer is C. Why? Because the halo effect is a cognitive bias in which the in which judgments of an individual's character can be affected by the overall impression of the individual. Clearly, you think Glenn is such a great guy, and therefore the cookies he brings must be fantastic. So, 
correct answer for 10 is going to be C. This is halo effect. 11 says a friend wins a tennis game and says, I trained so hard that was a great win. When she loses a subsequent match, she says, my baby brother kept me up all night crying. I was tired for the match. These statements reflect which of the following principles? Fundamental attribution bias, fundamental attribution error, self-serving bias, or esteem bias. Now, self-serving bias refers to the fact that individuals will view their own successes as being based on internal factors while viewing failures as being based on external factors, which is exactly what's happening here. When they win the match, they're like, I worked so hard for it. That's why I won. But when they lose the match, they try to blame it on some external factor like her baby brother keeping her up at night. And so this, these statements reflect self-serving bias. 11 is C. 12 says Carl is always happy and smiling. Today, you notice he seems down and thinks something must have happened to upset him. What types of attributions are you making? Now, we talked about attribution theory, how it focuses on the tendency for individuals to infer the causes of others' behavior. We have dispositional or internal causes. Those are those that relate to the features of the person whose behavior is being considered. And then there's situational or external causes. These are related to features of the surroundings or, or social context. Now, you think after seeing Carl be sad, you think something happened to him to make him upset, which means that you are demonstrating situational or external causes towards his sadness. And so that means statements two and three are correct, not one or four. And so the correct answer for 12 is going to be C. Let's go ahead and move into problem 13. 13 says a group of men and women are going to be rated on their driving abilities. The role of gender is really emphasized in the experiment and the women perform worse than the men. In another experiment, the role of gender is not mentioned and the ratings are comparable between the two groups. Which principle do these results support? This is stereotype threat. Remember, stereotype threat refers to the concept of people being concerned or anxious about confirming a negative stereotype of their social group. Stereotype threat can hinder performance, creating a self-fulfilling prophecy. When we talked about this in lecture, we talked about an example where they had a woman take a mathematics exam in a group of men all right. And they and that woman performed worse based off of the fact that she was, you know, feeling the stereotype threat being in a room full of men when mathematics has been for a long time, a male dominating field. And we're seeing the same exact thing here, just with driving abilities. And so the correct answer for 13 is going to be B. 14 says the behavior that accompanies the negative attitudes a person has towards a group or individual is referred to as blank. Is it stereotyping, cultural relativism, prejudice, or discrimination? Discrimination is when prejudice attitudes cause individuals of a particular group to be treated differently than others. Remember, prejudice is an attitude, but discrimination is a behavior. And so the correct answer for 14 is going to be D. Then last but not least, we have 15, which says game theory is designed to study blink, reliance on central traits, behavior attribution, decision-making behavior, or self-enhancement. Game theory was originally designed to study decision-making behavior in economics and mathematics, and it has now been used to describe decision-making in other fields as well, like politics, biology, philosophy, and so on. The correct answer for 15 is going to be C. Game theory is designed to study decision-making behavior. And with that, we've completed our practice problem set. I really hope this was helpful. Let me know if you have any questions, comments, concerns down below. Other than that, good luck, happy studying, and have a beautiful, beautiful day, future doctors.